And we are live. Hello, everybody. I am RJ Carter, senior editor at CriticalBlast.com, author of The Destroyer, Monumental Terror, out the past two weeks now, if you're a Remo Williams fan. Uh, go hit Amazon, check that out. If you like it, please leave a review. If you don't, don't say anything. That's how this game works. With me today, we have Alex from Kursova Magazine. Hey, everybody. And we were going to have Michael Tierney from the comic book store in Little Rock, and we still may if he can get on. Uh, but we do need to probably start a GoFundMe so that Michael can get a computer made within the last five years because the uh, StreamYard isn't working on the OS he's got right now, and he's trying to use it on his phone. So hopefully he'll be popping in here. We have Dangerous Dave Dyer in the background here. Uh, he's going to be our silent Bob. Dave, Dave has got toothache going on, so he's not going to say a whole lot. So we were going to talk about, of course, 35 years of Wild Stars. We're going to put that on hold for a little bit, just in case Michael can get here, because that is his book. Uh, we will talk about some of the other things that have come out. Let's start with the Million Dollar uh, Baby. This is, of course, the Cyber Frog Blood Honey from Ethan Van Skyver. Uh, this is a $25 book, which is a bit hefty price for an 80-page giant, but it is what it is with Indiegogo's and crowdfunding, I guess. You can't get into a comic book for less than $25 this way. Or can you, Alex? Uh, you guys can't see me because I don't have video on, but I'm blinking. <laughs> <laughs> is it Morse code? No, no. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent with how things are in comics in general right now. It's like there are some titles and some stuff up that are, that's going on that I really love. There's a lot of stuff that I hate. I, I have been absolutely blown away. The best Bat comic I have read probably in the last 10 years. Those new Snickers ads. Oh, my God. They managed to fit like a five-act Silver Age Batman story in two pages using classic art. And I'm like, who are these guys? Kick, kick off whoever's on one of the main books now and give those guys an ongoing. Put them on my poll. I would read a 21-page comic monthly that has Snickers comics by the guys who are doing the Batman Snickers comics right now. They're that good. They're DC's that much really got to quit. Most of the stuff I'm reading. <laughs> Yeah, DC's really got to quit putting those ads in their comics, especially the Batman comics, because it just underscores <laughs> how, how bad some things are. Uh, because, like, the, we're on a beach with Catwoman. We're crying. We're talking about mom. All of a sudden, there's action. Hey, where did this come from? She's a villain again. He's chasing her. Oh, crap. It's an ad. And we're back to moping. Yeah. Well, at this point, the only ongoing Batman I'm reading is Batman and the Outsiders. And that that has unfortunately been my disappointment of 2019 because I, I'm a huge Batman and the Outsiders fan and I really like Tinian's tech run and I was kind of hoping this would be picking that up and it has to an extent but the pacing has just been a snail's pace. I'm like six issues in the original run they'd already cleared up a civil war in Markovia. They'd already done a team up with the Teen Titans. In the 90s run, they'd fought off an army of vampires and zombies and just six issues in and we're still at Raj Ghul is implying that Batman may be lying to you. It's like, Have they oh had lunch God. yet? It's, it's not even like they're writing for the trades. They're writing for for like the phone book. Oh, Lord. Well, have they had lunch yet? Because that's the big thing, is to sit around and eat. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what but we want by comics. The thing is, 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 I've read some of Brian Edward Hill's stuff that is really good. I loved his tech run that led into this. I loved his short story in Cursed Comics Cavalcade, which was re just reprinted in The Ghost's Giant that came out this month. And, like, the short story was fantastic. The lead-in was fantastic. But I don't know. Like, this... this this new run has just been just going at a snail's pace. And I'm like, something happened already. Well, I was going to, I was going to drop it at six, but the story didn't end at issue six. Like it's still <laughs> going. The first arc is still going. Well, let's talk about something else going on in little rock while we're waiting for Michael. Um, there is a new comic book company that's sprung out of the Indiegogo uh, culture. Uh, 
how, how familiar are you with Mitch Breitweiser and his, uh, his new venture there? Uh, I don't really know Mitch all that well. Uh, I'm probably not the best person to talk about with, uh, on, on that stuff, just cause I don't really know those guys. I know Tim, I know, I know Mark, but I'm, I'm a little bit on the outside and the fringe of the comic sphere. Well, Get get in the middle of that one because that looks like it's going to be something. Somebody's finally created a um, a comic book house inside of IGG with multiple titles and multiple creators, and it's uh, it's Mitch Breitweiser. Uh, now I'm a little disappointed with it, uh, only insofar as that he's leapt into this new thing with three new titles and hasn't turned out Red Rooster yet, which uh, you know is well, late. There is, uh, there is wicked publishing i think it's called and they're working with the the mythoverse guys and the connection with arkansas there is uh raven monroe is originally from arkansas she's from van buren originally and she's got an indiegogo for her machi the witch title and so she's kind of in with that crowd and uh wicked is, is getting some stuff out and i think mythoverse is finally going to be coming out like in the next week or so in physical i know the first two digital have, have delivered now are any of the Indiegogo people distributing to stores? Um, because, you know, I'm showing this to Dave. He's talking about how great the art is. He wants to get some copies. Well, the, what do I tell him? You know? I know we're getting stuff in stores. I know Tim is getting his stuff in stores through a deal with Antarctic. Uh, like, I know that Michael's store carries Tim's stuff. I know that Michael's store carries rags. I uh, don't know how many of the other Indiegogo people have have got their stuff out into stores. So, so White Antarctic is carrying some of the um, Indiegogo and Kickstarter books that make it out there without them having to sue the pants off of somebody to get the rights to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just like just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the new uh, Walmart from from Tim came out in stores. That is a slightly different edition from the the Indiegogo edition. Okay, and that's the uh, continuation of his My Hero Magademia series. Yeah, yeah. The next, the next Trump uh, spinoff here. And Soul Finder may or may not be in stores. I mean, I'm, I'm not the one to ask, though. I'm not handling that, and so. Uh, Michael says he's watching the podcast, but it won't let him type a comment. Michael, you, there's your comment. You finally found a way to comment. Ah, uh, my OS is too old to connect to the live stream. Yes. All right, we're going to hold a GoFundMe for Michael's store so that he can get. Uh, a computer, uh, maybe at Walmart that uh, has an OS system that will support all the new stuff. Michael, we're gonna just we're just gonna talk about you uh, <laughs> while you're lurking in the background here. Um, so we were just talking about some of the other Arkansas comics and the IGGs and how they're getting into stores. Um, Try to talk about Mitch Breitweiser's venture, but not getting too far on that one. One of the things yeah, I will sorry, bring up. Yeah, oh, that's all right. Uh, one of the other things we're going to have a review on at criticalblast.com uh, a little bit later this week is we have the screeners in for Wonder Woman Bloodlines. And this is continuing. This is still set in that cohesive DC animated universe. I don't know if you've seen any of the stuff they've been putting out lately, Alex. I've seen some of the old <laughs> stuff. And let me guess, it's not Bloodlines like the old 90s event Bloodlines, is it? No. Oh, uh, I love Bloodlines. <laughs> It's, it's interesting in that um, that first Wonder Woman animated movie, they, they've sort of just done away with it or they've written around it because this thing starts off with a, the origin of Wonder Woman all over again, how Steve Trevor's crashing, uh, Steve Trevor's fighting parademons of all things when he crashes into Paradise Island. So it sets things up for things that happened before Justice League War where she uh, is there and becomes part of the Justice League. Uh, and then it continues after that. So it's like, Here's, here's origin, I'm leaving Paradise Island, I'm kicked out, I'm in exile. Skip some years, and now we're into the George Perez run with uh, Julia Capitalis and her daughter Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa becoming the Silver Swan. Uh, they're having to fight uh, the Cheetah, they're having to fight Giganta. All the classic Wonder Woman villains are in here. Uh, even right up to Veronica Kale. And it, it's it's an interesting story of, um, you know, she gets back to Themyscira and reunites with her mother and becomes a true, uh, a true Amazon again. Uh, it, it's the new 52 version. So I'm having to do some research, I guess in the new 52, they did revamp Etta Candy into a, a new kind of character. Uh, 
she's now the walking, living embodiment of uh, Meyer's third law of sidekicks, which is uh, if you're a sidekick, you are going to be a black, thick lesbian uh, who's very, very smart with the science. So Etta Candy fulfills, checks every box off, which is, it's fine. Her character works. It was just kind of a departure for me. Because, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an 80s baby. That was when I was reading comics. But I'm going to give it a good recommendation. It's a good, good flick. Also in our DVD section here, uh, this is something we're doing here with Cosmic Comics and Belleville jointly. We are giving away the first season of The Haunting of Hill House. So if you go to criticalblast.com and go to the contest section, this will be up there. There's multiple ways to enter here. It's a lot of social media interaction. Uh, you can also you know, find a way to enter at the uh, Cosmic Comics Belleville Facebook page and their Instagram. You'll find you know, little uh, links to it. Also a QR code scanner. You can just scan it and be taken right there on your phone. Uh, Dave, you said this is a pretty good. I, I can vouch that that's a good one. Yeah, to me, <clears throat> sorry if I sound like I have marbles in my mouth. Um, it is one of the best new um, horror um, shows that is on Netflix right now. Um, so if you just like a good uh, ghost story, this, I loved it. Loved it. Really got me involved. Great acting, great characters, great story, great scares, good special effects. I I'm, I'm, can't wait for season two on this one. And one thing I'll throw out there is... It doesn't have a lousy cop out ending. There are so many horror shows right. and horror movies that'll give you just lousy, stupid cop out ending. It'll be a downer ending, or like, oh, the good guy escaped and then gets killed after all. No, it doesn't do that. It actually has like a genuinely satisfying ending that makes you say to yourself, I'm glad I watched this. I'm glad I saw yeah. the end. I'm happy with how it turned out for these characters. Yeah, it actually, and I got so involved in it, and um, I got really, at the end, uh, my wife and I really got kind of teared up on it, because you got so involved in these characters. Um, really, like I said, some of the greatest acting I've seen on this show in a long time. Um, and if anybody under knows the stories of the, of the Hill House, um, like if you've ever seen the movie The Haunting, that's about Hill House as well. Uh, there was a film done in the 70s, uh, also a, a Haunting of Hill House. This does not follow those stories. This is a fresh new ghost story. Uh, just so happens that Hill House is the main character in it. So um, just really good. Good good shock value all the way around. Now that's interesting. You just said the house is a character. Mm -hmm, it is. How would you expound on that so people can, who haven't seen it? Yeah, if out. anybody remembers American Ghost Story or American, what is it, American Ghost Story? Yeah, American, American horror, story. horror Story. Yeah, the very first season, uh, which was basically a, um, a Hill House kind of story in that first season. The house is the main antagonist. The house is the main uh, character. And, and all the characters that are in it are just sub-characters. The house is what I consider the main the main story and is the main character itself. So, so where would you guys rank this with um, shows like Amityville or The Shining? haunted house stories uh i wouldn't rank it in there at all i i would actually like i said this would remind me of some like of the old hammer films um of um there was a, a movie and i know my horror stuff so well thank you uh with um Roddy mcdowell in it i would say that's more like that it's just a good old-fashioned ghost story so amityville my problem with a with a movie like Amityville or even the book is that it was fake. So, and even though this is fake, you still could, as you're watching it, go, okay, there's got to be some reality. My wife even asked if the Hill House ever really existed, and I said, not as Hill House, but there are so many other houses that this was this story was probably based off of. Uh, well, also another really cool thing about this is a sort of mise en scene where you have the people who are in the movie telling ghost stories and the ghost yeah. stories that they tell are good, scary ghost stories. And yeah, so I yeah, and I agree with that. I mean, I would put this, you know, I love I my favorite genre is a ghost story genre. I would there's an old movie that came out in 1981 called Ghost Story. It had all the classic actors like Fred Astaire in it and um um 
Craig Lawson was in it, who was like the guy in the eighties. Um, had um, and then of course I'm drawing a blank on everybody. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. That was a really good ghost story. Uh, White Noise with Michael Keaton is a good ghost story. I will definitely put this show in that category of really good sound ghost stories. The Conjuring, another good ghost story. That yeah. would I would put that in that. Kind well, of and I mean, not, not just that. Like you have you have characters who are literally telling a ghost story in the show. Yeah. And even if it's just a shot of somebody talking, telling you this story, the story they're telling is so good, so compelling. That, mm -hmm. You know, you don't mind. You don't even realize that you've been sitting there for 10 minutes just watching this person do a single take scene of mm -hmm. telling this ghost story. You're blown away by the ghost story. You don't realize that they had to do that in one take. Yeah, and and the the, so the single take shots in this that are just amazing and well done and well acted. It's just yeah, and and, and the, you take a step the, back and think about it. The family that's in this show is dysfunctional as hell. Like every, so we cool. can all kind of identify with you know this kind of a family because you know you got the one timid little sister, and then you've got the uh, the older sister who's become you know pretty well off. Then you got the the uh, black sheep, which is the brother, who's an author, and he's written a book about them as, as you know, their family growing up in Hill House, and they don't like the fact that he's exploited the family, and you know these stories, these ghost stories are supposed to be, they you know, it was personal, and he's cashed in and made a lot of fucking money off of it. <laughs> so, and Michael has chimed in here, says there's a ghost story. Bringing it back around to the full circle. Way to go, Michael. Uh, there's a ghost story in Wild Stars 1, Book of Circles, with a Confederate ghost interacting in the life of his descendant by the same name. Ooh, I like that. Uh, that there, you know what? That was. Uh, there was another story where uh, a Confederate ghost interacted with his descendant uh, who had the same name. Anybody remember Jeb Stewart? Silence. Yeah. Yeah, DC silence. Comics, The Haunted Tank. Still silence. What year? Oh, well, it, what year? It was like the 80s, the 70s and 80s when DC was publishing Ghosts and they were publishing yeah. Weird War Tales. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was okay. one of the Weird War Tales oh, okay. segments, all the, recurring all the time. Okay. Um, J.E.B. Stewart, and he would always tell the tank, go this way or go that way. And he'd be like, only, the, only his descendant could see him and understand it. And he'd follow the instructions and the rest of the crew would say, hey, oh, yep, Michael remembers. Okay. And they'd say, okay, Jeb's, Jeb's lost it, Jeb's crazy again, but, you know, they'd come out of it unscathed, and hmm. uh, they'd, they'd always be questioning, well, I guess the ghost was talking to him again. I love all those kind of, I used to read all those haunted tales, uh, House of Secrets, and so on. That stuff's starting to come back around, and so I glad. So. It, you used to get three, maybe four, full length, that felt like stories mm -hmm. in a comic book, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and they were really surprising endings. Uh, and now it's more like, you know, when, they, when I, the ones that I have seen come back and try to come back, they just go more for the whole vertigo feel factor. Yeah. Like, you know, let, let's just make you creepy and uncomfortable. Uh, but it doesn't have that that O. Henry shock value to it. The new uh, DC uh, Ghosts Giant actually has some some pretty good shorts in it. Now, are those reprints or are they brand new stories? They're, well, uh, there are two or three brand new stories, and most of the reprints are actually from last year's Cursed Comics Cavalcade. Which was great, yeah. Good. So, if yeah, you, you haven't picked up, ghosts. pick up the Ghosts Giant. Well, while Michael's here, let's try to talk a little bit. We're, we're going we're gonna to let Dave rest his jaw there. Yeah. He's, keep the sharp pains from shooting up to his temple. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Wild Stars, Book of Circles, because, well, that was the very first book. Uh, Alex, fill us in on what the third, uh, what the final book here is. I've lost count. I don't know if it's third or fourth. I almost said a number. Uh, we're, up, we're up to book four now on Wild Stars. The the concept behind Wild Stars is seventy five thousand years ago, mankind left on an exodus from Earth to the Wild Stars, and during the intervening time, all the extraterrestrial visits to Earth, the ancient alien stuff. That's all just the people who went on the exodus coming back and checking on things, making everything sure everything's copacetic here on earth. Well, the new wild stars book is the first one that actually goes all the way back to the 75,000 years ago during the exodus from Atlantis. It explains why mankind had to 
make that exodus to the stars, but it also moves the story forward because there's a lot of time travel in Wild Stars to the events following the third book in the future. So I've told people before, I've got this kind of machete order where if you're new to Wild Stars, something you could do is you could pick up the fourth book, you could read the first half of it, then read Wild Stars one through three, and then finish the new one, and you'd get the full story. And this is a, it's an unusual way of telling a story because it starts out as a novel, and then it goes into comic books, and then it goes into an illustrated novel again. Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, the, uh, the, the first volume of Wild Stars was comics, but those comics are adapted from novels that Michael had written in the 70s. So with the, are you going to take your machete method at some point and apply it to uh, putting out a Wild Stars omnibus? Uh, I don't think so, because we just put out a Wild Stars omnibus, but if people are interested, they could still try it with it. We just put out a hardcover that is phone book sized, 700 plus pages that reprints all of the Book of Circles comics, the Force Majeure novel comic hybrid, the novella that we published last year, Time Warmageddon, plus all the expanded content. And then finally, it's also got the new novel and a almost 30,000 word bio glossary cyclopedia of the Wild Star setting. So anything you want to know about the Wild Star's names, places, people, things, it's got all that in the appendix. Awesomeness, awesomeness, awesome. I'm glad that it's, it's still going on here. Uh, I know I was reading Wild Stars, God, was it 20 years ago? Uh, <laughs> When, when I was living in Little Rock and Michael was my go-to LCS. Uh, and there was all kinds of drama there, which I'm not going to bring up again, but if you want to read about it, it's definitely in the archives at Critical Blast in our interview section. Uh, it's, it's had a rich and varied history in getting its stuff out there. Um, so let's see, what else can we talk about here? I had, an, I had a tangent I was going to go off on, and now I've lost it. Uh, well, uh, we were, we were going to talk about Tarzan and the Mysterious She. That's the other book that you guys have done that Michael has picked up on. Uh, and yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Where that, that was actually started by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Yeah, it was a fragment written by Edgar Rice Burroughs, posthumously completed by Michael Tierney. It was a lost fragment or at least lost for a while, because the estate had no idea where it was. Uh, I think the ERB fanzine guy eventually piped up when we published it and said, oh, hey, I've actually got the original of it here. So okay. it became found during the process of publishing the story. Was it was it any different from the you know the, what you had to work off of? Uh, I, well, that'd be a question for Michael, because my, what Michael had, had was what Danton Burroughs had sent him, and what we had was what Michael had completed based on the fragment that Danton had sent him, and the digital uh, typed up copy was what the Edgar Rice Burroughs fanzine people had sent back because they'd had the fragment to digitize and get typed up so that it could be shopped around to be completed at some point. But after Danton Burroughs passed away following the fire that destroyed a bunch of the records and stuff, the, the fragment sort of became lost, forgotten about, but Michael happened to still have his completed version of it. And at one point he showed it to me and I was like, this is amazing. What would it take to do to get this? And so we ended up just working things out with the estate. And the, the funny thing is, is the estate didn't know what we had. The estate, I think, thought that it was just a pastiche, an Edgar Rice Burroughs sort of fan story, a, or a Tarzan fan story. They didn't know that this was actually based on a, an Edgar Rice Burroughs fragment. So they, they had us scrambling back and forth like the day of making edits to the contract when they figured out that it was actually Edgar Rice Burroughs, because at first they were saying, well, you can't put Edgar Rice Burroughs' name on it. And, and Michael's like, well, it, it, Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote about half of it. And I'm like... 
well, if they don't want us to put his name on it, we can adjust our contracts to say he didn't. But yeah, yeah. that kind of cuts them out of some money, doesn't it? Yeah, well, and the, the thing was, though, is that it was the, the cutoff day and we'd already made all the negotiations for it. And so I, I think Krasova kind of ended up with it for a song. And I think we ended up paying Michael a little bit extra than what we'd originally agreed on, because I think the estate wanted all the money that we had offered. Well, that begs the question, is that the only fragment of a story that's floating around there with uh, that Edgar Rice Burroughs started? Or are there others that are just uh, ideas he had that he didn't finish up that are still ripe for taking? There may be some other fragments out there. I'm, I'm not aware of them. And it's, it's just one of those things where if, if it turns up, it turns up. All right. And, and one of the things that Michael is still doing with, uh, the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate is the web comic for beyond the farthest star that's still going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that's how far that going. can go, or if you're making, I don't know if you're adapting or if you're making new stories. Uh, so I don't know if there's like, you know, we're so far into the adaptation or we're continuing forward and we continue, we plan to continue in ad infinitum. And, uh, well, down, over here in the chat, Michael says that the fragment uh, that young Tarzan and Mysteria She is based on, he left intact. And for the most part, we also left it intact during our editorial process. Cause I'm pretty much like, all right, I know which portion is Burroughs. And even if there's temptation there, I'm not going to mess with it. I'm not going to change his sentence structures to make anything read more smoothly. And, you know, m maybe that's a mistake on my end, but, you know, you don't want to mess with the master sometimes. I completely agree. I had a, my, my first published book was um, uh, Alice's Journey Beyond the Moon, which was the third Alice in Wonderland story. And my editors in England kept sending it back saying, well, you know, we got some really, we love the story. We're going to print it, but we got to change some of the grammar here because, you know, you've got things like can't and you went C-A-N apostrophe. Well, I had more than one apostrophe. I had C-A apostrophe N apostrophe T. He's like, that's, you know, why are you doing that? And I'm like, well, if you take the actual manuscript of Alice's Journey Underground and how Lewis Carroll or Charles Dodgson wrote, this is the format he followed. And I'm trying to stay, you know, uh, to give it this verisimilitude that this is actually something he wrote. And they looked at it and said, oh, never mind. And you know, <laughs> move forward from there. So, yeah, keep yeah. the original yeah. sentence structure and then try to keep it uh, as true to form as possible. Yeah, and of course, one of the things that, that just kept happening with Young Tarzan and Mysterious She is no one knew which part was Michael's and which was Burroughs. People would, would try to make guesses and they'd, they'd get them mixed up. Or or the best cases were the ones where people just say, we don't know where Burroughs ends and yours begins. Well, there you go. That proves you've gotten into the head of the writer and you were able to uh, carry on from there. Michael says he's working on a new Tarzan novel. And a weekly online strip beyond the farthest star. We just talked about that, but there's a new Tarzan novel. Is that going through Kursova or is that uh, something he's doing with a book publisher? Uh, right now, that that's up in the air. I would love an opportunity to to get a shot at serializing it, but that's still up in the air. We we can't make any any claims on it, any promises. We'd have to hammer stuff out with Michael and with the with the estate. But now, how, how does that work? I mean, is Tarzan public domain? Uh, the character, I believe, is public domain. The estate has a trademark on the name and image. They have uh, trademarks on Burroughs' name. So, so you, th there are a number of legal issues that have not been fully sussed out, in part because when Dynamite comics were doing their Edgar Rice Burroughs based comics instead of letting things go to court, they ended up uh, settling and making an agreement with the estate so that it could be estate sanctioned. But there, there is, there, there are a lot of questions surrounding the public domain status of a lot of Burroughs characters because some of the books and works themselves are in public domain. Technically the characters themselves are in public domain, but because they have registered trademarks on the names and a lot of the images and they are a company with money and lawyers, not everyone is willing to press the question of how far that you could go with it. 
sure, th- we're, sure. we're going to see the exact same thing happen as soon as, as Batman and Superman fall into the public domain, for instance. Well, they'll fall into public domain, but because of trademarks, it'd be almost useless to try to tell a story with them. Uh, exactly. If, because DC exactly. does maintain the trademarks. I think uh, the difference between someone like Superman and Batman and, say, the Black Terror is that a trademark wasn't kept up on the characters, if that's the way I'm reading it correctly. So anybody can do a Black Terror comic book. Yeah, yeah. So we just need to find, you know, I'm sure there's a whole collection of superheroes out there that are trademark and copyright free now that could just be... Yeah, there, there's actually an archive of... Uh, a large number of public domain pulp era and early silver age superheroes and comics that are now public domain that a bunch of people do do stuff with because they they're essentially free properties now okay so michael just said the names are trademarked i'm assuming you're talking about the tarzan one there and the different tarzan characters but uh, certainly you know the the black terror uh the green llama every, anything that dynamite is doing with their uh Super Project Superpowers, those are all public domain characters. Uh, Airboy, they, they've been in Eclipse comics way back in the 80s. Uh, they're in, um, I've seen them in other books. I know that uh, Alan Moore used the Black Terror in his uh, Tom Strange series. So that's, he's just somebody who can go around. And speaking of trademarks, I'm, I'm kind of loath to make Dave talk again here, and he knows where I'm going with this probably. Yeah. But um, they are working on a script here for, a new film of The Shadow. So I'm going to make him mumble a little bit more here. Yeah, I've been uh, working on a script with my fellow um, writer, uh, Garrett Pelch, who lives here in Belleville. And we're working on a new um, script uh, for a movie that we hope to start lensing uh, in 2020 on The Shadow. Um, this is a whole new updated version um, where our character, The Shadow, uh, has still been working with the Tolku, even though the Tolku is dead. And if we recall the Tolku from the Shadow movie back in the 90s uh, with Alec Baldwin. Um, so Lamont is is now, you know, quite old because he's immortal now, because he's learned um, the process of immortality through the Tolku. And, uh, but he's also been trying to keep the Shadow at bay and the Shadow hasn't made an appearance since the 80s. So our story draws the shadow back out without giving too much. Um, uh, uh, An evil villain from his past pops up and uh, um, the shadow comes out. Lamont and the shadow come out of hiding, so to speak, or come out of the shadows. That's I think you just titled it. Yeah. (laughs) Come out of the shadows. That's a good idea. Thanks. I didn't have a working title yet. So so it's coming along really well. We're about uh, a quarter of the way through the script. Uh, we write uh, quite a few times a month, so uh, we should have this uh, in the can. Uh, we'll probably do a second draft real quick, and then uh, hopefully start pre-production in the winter of 2020. But once again, um, if I recall, the shadow now turns 90 years old in 2020, and like these characters you guys were just talking about, the shadow um, is actually a... a um, um, is only owned by lawyers and it goes back up for sale in 2020. So um, we're looking into seeing if we can even buy the rights to it. So Condé Nast is no longer owning the trademark or does Condé Nast not even exist anymore? It doesn't even exist anymore. Lawyers, um, there is the, there's actually not even in a state for the original writer of The Shadow. So, um, which I found really bizarre was a Maxwell, um, I'm totally drawn a blank. Um, but, um, yeah, there's not even a state unlike like Edgar Rice Burroughs has an estate and, uh, um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe has an estate, um, and so on. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has an estate, but, uh, the writer of the shadow, there's no state. So lawyers pretty much have it. And I don't even know if the lawyers are going to do much with it. So yeah. Doyle does have an estate, but everybody writes a Sherlock Holmes novel and they don't seem to give a care about well, trying to get a, an approval. Uh, if you do get an approval, then it's considered an official Sherlock Holmes. Right, thing. right, exactly. Just like, like, um, you know, and I was always under the assumption. In, in a lot of cases, that's really all you can do is have stuff be sanctioned by the estate or not sanctioned right. by the estate because some of the stuff is so old that it's, it's 
it's public domain and all of the stuff that's part of it, part of the property is public domain. Where mm -hmm. we have issues are 20th century works where the early stuff is public domain and the later stuff is very slowly rolling into public domain. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael yep. over there in the chat says that it's the names that are trademarked, that are key Natural phrases that are, that are trademarked. And uh, right. well, that means you could use them in the story. You just couldn't use them in the title or the marketing or anything. Yeah. 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 So you could have a novel or, mm -hmm. or even a comic book. Well, now that gets, I think comic books a little bit touchier there because you couldn't call the comic book Batman or even detective comics. You could call it like, uh, Nights in the City or something, and then it would have Batman in it, but now you've got the actual image of Batman as well if you're in a comic book. Uh, and I think that image itself is also trademarked. Well, you look like, uh, look at the, the, well, but it was a fan film, so there's no money that is being generated for the film, so that's how fan films get away with it, because they're not charging people to see the film. They put it on YouTube, it's free to look up, so that's how they get around the the issues, you know, I would like to be able to charge people to, you know, buy a DVD or, or whatever of the shadow film. Um, but, uh, and like I said, I don't think that, and, and thank you, Michael, for reminding me, Maxwell Grant is the creator of the uh, shadow. Um, yeah, I just don't, I don't think from everything I've looked into, there is nothing that says that I have to pay Maxwell Grant for his estate, which like I said, I don't know where that estate is because nothing comes up on it. So if it's just owned by lawyers, some lawyer may say, hey, I own the trademark. Right. Because you can't call your movie the shadow colon subtitle. You, you could say that. Yeah. For, but like I said, as far as I understand, the rights to the shadow go up for sale on the 90th anniversary. So it could be anybody's game there. Yeah. You know, and we're looking into it. We got lawyers looking into it to see whether it's going to run us to if we could buy it and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm talking about just buying the rights for a couple of years just so I can get the film out, maybe, maybe make a little profit off of it. Right. And, you know, and then it, it's like new Constantine when they own the fantastic four, um, you know, they, they kept opting option to keep the, the, the rights to the, to the fantastic four by making films, yeah. you know, so well, until, that's how we ended up with that Roger Corman version. Right. Right. Which would never got released because they just optioned the, to keep the rights to the to the franchise so so yeah i mean and you guys are writing about tarzan and you know and you're actually calling him tarzan so did you get did you get uh the okay from the estate or did they kind of slam yeah, you this, this, was, this was an official tarzan release it was that's awesome licensed uh we have contracts with the estate it is canon it is an official canon Tarzan story out in current year. That's great. I'm going to, I'm definitely, you got a fan here. I'll be reading it because I'm a huge Tarzan fan. And that's why I was always so, um, you know, um, I carry the comics here at our shop, which I'm sure you guys do at yours that, that I carry the you know, land before time and, and um, um, warlord of Mars, all of that, you know, which is, um, um, goes through the estate because they use the actual name on there, or even yeah. Edgar Allan Poe, Snifter of Terror, you know, and it says Edgar Allan Poe right there. So, so um, how how do uh, retailers go ahead and get copies of this uh, of uh, Kurzweil magazine uh, with Young Tarzan and the Mysterious She? I mean, mm -hmm. is that a diamond issue thing, or do you go through another uh, distributor? Uh, we we're distributed through Ingram Content. So if you're a bookseller with access to the Ingram catalog, you can you can pick it up at retailer wholesale rates. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely look into that and see if we can get that into our shop. Yeah, that would be awesome. And if yeah. if uh, if you're interested in any of our other stuff, uh, drop me a line. I can I can uh, get you stuff sent directly if you're interested right. in more more Corsova oh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll get it from him. So good, man. I appreciate that. All right. Well, that's all we've got for today. Um, next month, we're going to kind of have a focused feature on filmation and talk about Lou Scheimer and everything he did. 
Uh, if we're lucky, fingers crossed, we might have some of the voice actors uh, that might join our chat. Um, no, uh, no, no guarantee, so I'm not going to mention any names just yet, but I'm certainly excited about one of them uh, and possibly the other one. Well, one of them is a bigger name than the other, actually, and the, the lesser name is just a better character for me. Than, yeah, it depends on how you look at it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. All right, so Alex, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Michael, thank you for participating through the chat. Uh, you know, people will be able to read all your stuff before they ever listen to all of our stuff. And we will be back here the first Sunday of November. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Take Thanks. care.